Thank you, Alistair. And uh, on the issue of technology, I have an optimistic message because technology, I think, will deliver. Uh, but uh, I have many pessimistic messages as well, which do not relate to technology. Uh, as you said, I am a chemical engineer by training. I went to the United, uh, uh, graduate of the National Technical University of Athens. I went to the US for graduate studies, taught uh, at Caltech and MIT. Uh, I've taught uh, for the last uh, 15 years a course on sustainable energy. Uh, and I have co-founded a startup company that was funded by Total Energy. Uh, but I'm not here to tell you about my bio. I'm here to tell you uh, to share with the audience the experiences that uh, I had in this journey uh, and uh, um, <clears throat> tell you how they relate to climate change. So my first message is that uh, basically I am very pessimistic about the prospects of uh, uh, taking control, control of the accumulation of greenhouse gases and also the ability of global institutions in dealing with an issue of uh, this uh, type. Uh, despite many encouraging uh, signs, for example, it's very heartening to hear that uh, Greece uh, is uh, receiving more than 50% of its electricity from renewable resources and the target they are on course of achieving 80% of that by uh, 2030. Uh, but uh, uh, I disagree with Andreas, who was very optimistic because, for example, instead of 3.6%, uh, I'm sorry, 3.6 degrees Celsius increase by, 20, by 2100, we are only going to have uh, 2.6 uh, degrees Celsius, which means that uh, instead of going very rapidly to the abyss, we are going to slow down a little bit, but still it's going to be the path to the abyss. Uh, uh, there are um, uh, no signs of uh, abating the CO2 accumulation. It is increasing. We heard from uh, uh, Mr. Renzi that uh, there is an increase in the consumption of uh, coal instead of reducing the consumption of, of coal. Um, there is uh, an increase in, in the CO2, as I said, and most importantly, and this is a word that's not been uh, mentioned at all in this conference, is the whole issue of uh, liquid fuels. Uh, I, I'm raising the issue of liquid fuels for the first time here. Perhaps you can say that uh, electrification of the transportation sector is going to reduce the demand in liquid fuels, which is true. But let me remind you that uh, uh, phasing, out <coughs> phasing out the existing fleet of uh, internal combustion engines is going to take more than 100 years. The shipping industry needs liquid fuels. The tracking industry needs liquid fuels. And I don't think anybody is going to get on an airplane which is going to be powered by a battery uh, for at least uh, 50 to 100 years. So we are going to need liquid fuels. And uh, at the present time, there is no technology for the production of renewable liquid fuels. The Department of Energy in the United States has been investing for more than 60 years for, in the production of, ligno, of uh, uh, liquid fuels from lignocellulosic feedstocks. Uh, unsuccessfully, the last such plant uh, closed down two years ago, and there is no technology right now which is going to produce liquid fuels. So liquid fuels, are they important? They do contribute in the United States more than 34% of the total carbon which is emitted in the whole economy. So they are an extremely important sector in the production of liquid fuels, I mean the production of carbon dioxide. And I just don't see anything there. So uh, what can be done? Um, I've been making notes about uh, certain topics that were raised by previous speakers, and I want to say a few words about that. Mm -hmm. uh, one of them was education. Of course we need to educate uh, uh, people, but uh, I'd like to see some numbers that follow the assertions that education is the key, because it is not, in my opinion. For example, they did a study in the United States among 15 to 18 year olds, asking them what, is, what are the two most important concerns that they have. And climate change was the number one. Number two was shootings in the schools. Mm -hmm. They did the same thing in China, and climate change again came as the number one. Number two was their concern about how to score in the entrance examinations to universities. So you see the difference in, in the two societies. Uh, so I would say that education is important, but uh, 
the message has registered with 15 to 18 year olds that climate change is important. Keep in mind that these are not voting people yet, so perhaps this is the reason that politicians don't listen to them. Uh, but they are going to vote at some point, and this is going to be a major uh, uh, element in uh, making their decision about whom to, to select. So I don't think education is uh, the critical issue. It is always important, but I'm trying to find out what is the most critical issue which is really going to make a difference. Um, I heard something about the shipping industry. Uh, the shipping industry and uh, the fuels they need in order to reduce uh, uh, carbon emissions. Uh, I had a meeting uh, t two weeks ago in Shanghai with uh, uh, someone very deeply in the UK shipping industry, and he mentioned hydrogen, methanol, and uh, ammonia. And I asked the question, where do they come from? Where is an analysis that points into these three liquid fuels? He had no idea. And he is about to make major investment decisions on the use of these uh, three types of liquid fuels. I said, I know as chemical engineer that uh, ammonia is very energy intensive to make. So have you done a life cycle assessment so that we know how much energy goes into the production of ammonia and how much we are going to receive from this? He promised to send me uh, an LCA on ammonia, but I have not received it yet. And, uh, I invite anybody who has such an analysis to give it to me because I really want to know if ammonia is a player in this regard. <clears throat> then we have hydrogen as a potential fuel, but uh, the density of hydrogen is extremely low. And again, when I compare hydrogen to a liquid fuel, I think the liquid fuel comes uh, uh, much, uh, much better uh, uh, candidate uh, uh, for this uh, area. Then I heard about investing in technology. Uh, as an academic, uh, I would welcome more money and a lot more money to my laboratory for research. Uh, but let me tell you that there is a copious investment that's been made in the European Union and the United States and in China and in Japan in advancing different types of technologies. And I think they are all making great progress in many, many different areas. Uh, is more investment going to make a difference? Probably is going to help, but is it the critical factor? And I don't think it is. Uh, is it the different acronyms that people are inventing in order to solve problems? For example, I'm hearing about uh, aviation and sustainable aviation fuels. So pretty quickly you see, you, you hear the investment community is talking about SAFs, and uh, after you say SAEF for a few years, then it becomes a reality. So give me an SAEF and we solve the problem of the aviation industry. There are no SAEFs right now to satisfy the needs of the aviation industry at the scale that we need them. Or you hear something like CCS, which is carbon capture and sequestration. That was invented 15 years ago, and now my students come and they tell me we did this analysis with and without CCS, and here are the results. And I look at that and I say, okay, with CCS it looks good. Now go out there and try to buy a technology to do CCS because this is the winner. And of course, there is no vendor who is going to sell you a CCS at the present time. There is no place where you're going to put the trillions of tons of CO2 that the world is emitting uh, in, in various uh, areas. But CCS is out there, it's being used all the time as the panacea for solving this problem. And then, of course, we have net zero. I don't know how many times you heard net zero. Please keep in mind that net zero is supposed to happen by 2050, which is only 27 years away. 27 looks like a very long time, and we can lie about the future. We cannot lie about the past, because if you look at the previous 27 years and you see how much progress has been made, and if you consider how much time is needed in order to deploy new technology at that scale, there is no way that uh, uh, societies are going to have net zero by 2050. Uh, and this is uh, uh, something else to keep in mind. So what is to be done? Um, let me, be, before I tell you what I think needs to be done, and I'm going to offer just one answer to this because I don't like to confuse the message with too many things. Uh, before I give you the answer, 
I'd like to point out that uh, renewables and uh, low carbon fuels of any type are going to be expensive. And they are going to be more expensive than fossil fuels. And they are more expensive because we are not doing the accounting right. If we accounted for all the costs that a fuel incurs in a sustainable economy, then you need to account for the cost of removing the CO2. If you are digging up coal, you need to account for the cost of restoring the environment to the same uh, level as it was before. And we are not doing that. That's why we have unsustainable processes producing energy and many chemicals and fuels that we need today. If we did that, then um, we, need, we would have a different picture. So how do we re reward a technology which is not producing CO2? Or how do we penalize a technology which is producing a lot of CO2? The most efficient way to do that, my economist friends tell me in my class, sustainable energy is by a carbon tax. But the public, at least in the United States, will not go for the word tax. Politicians and the public hate the word tax. So I said, how about calling it a restoration fee? It's not a tax. It is a fee to restore the environment to its previous state. Maybe it will get some traction. I don't know. It was just an idea. Uh, there are various kinds of credits. Uh, and as far as I know, these credits are kind of a joke because if you give someone enough of a carbon credit, then you will see action in that area. If you reward someone with $20 per ton of CO2, nobody moves because the cost is higher than $20. If you give someone $200, you are going to see a rush to, with technologies to remove CO2. So clearly 200 is too uh, generous, 20 is not enough. And economists have a way to find the golden medium in between. But at this point, if you are an investor and you want to invest in green energy, the landscape is very confusing and very unclear. So in my opinion, the most uh, important thing that societies and uh, um, uh, people should do right now is to clarify, to, to clarify the investment climate that is going to govern green energy. Uh, and agree on this and make it very clear that uh, this is going to be the credit or the tax or whatever it is. And uh, I remember in Davos 18 years ago, there was a similar discussion that was preceded by the publication of a book which enumer enumerated all of the different technologies that would uh, generate uh, uh, generous returns on the investment if the landscape was clear. And they were talking about unleashing hundreds of billions of dollars in investment in green energy as soon as societies made a clear decision on what they need to be done in that area. So I talked for two months. Let me close by summarizing with three points. First of all, the title of this session. Uh, Technology and innovation will not drive the green transition. It is economists and politicians that will make the decisions. And then I guarantee you that technology is going to deliver on what is needed in order to achieve the green transition. This is one. Uh, the single most important action that needs to be taken, I think, is to clarify the investment environment. And then technology is going to come through. And I'm going to close with the following thought. If people gave climate change the urgency and the importance of a Manhattan project, I am convinced that you would see solutions coming in less than five years.